Oh, oh, oh. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Gulugar has started a morning program, okay? So, but sometimes we will change according to the events and also when there is a need, we will change to the uh, evening program. And today we are very, very fortunate, very grateful. Uh, we have uh, His Holiness Bhakti Vipna Vinash Narashima Maharaj here to Gulugar. A big Hari Bol to Maharaj. Hari Hari Bol. So, uh, maybe uh, for some, okay, a sannyasi visit maybe it's just something normal, but please make note that it is actually very, very special and very, very fortunate. Just by seeing a devotee, you know, a wonderful devotee that is gives you a lot of tremendous benefit for you spiritually. Okay, today we have a wonderful class, okay, and we will invite Maharaj to the class. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Okay. 
know Yashima Tenanda? You can sing, but it will go Thank you. 
Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 
Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So tonight we're reading Bhagavad Gita, chapter 12, which is entitled Devotional Service, text number 9. It's written on the board up here. So we invite you to repeat after me. Atachitam samadatam Atachitam samadatam Na shaknosi maistiram Na shaknosi maistiram Abhyasa yogena tato Abhyasa yogena tato Mam ichaptam dananjaya Mam ichaptam dananjaya Atachitam samadhatum Atachitam samadhatum Na shaknosi maistiram Na shaknosi maistiram Abhyasa yogena tato Abhyasa Mam ichaptam dananjaya Mam ichaptam dananjaya Atachitam samadhatum Atachitam samadhatum Na shaknosi maistiram Na shaknosi maistiram Abhyasa yogena tato Abhyasa yogena tato Mam ichaptam dananjaya Mam ichaptam Atachitam samadhatum Atachitam samadhatum Nasaknosi magistiram Nasaknosi magistiram Abhyasa yogi na tato Abhyasa yogi na tato Mamichaptum dananjaya Mamichaptum dananjaya Atachitam samadhatum Atachitam samadhatum Nasakno si mahistiram Nasakno si mahistiram Abhyasa yogi na tato Abhyasa yogi na tato Mamichaptum dananjaya Mamichaptum dananjaya Atachitam samadhatum Atachitam samadhatum Nasakno si mahistiram Nasakno si mahistiram Abhyasa yogi na tato Abhyasa yogi na tato Atachitam samadhatum Nasakno si maistiram Abhyasa yogi na tato Mamichaptum dananjaya Atachitam samadhatum Nasakno si maistiram Abhyasa yogi na tato Mamichaptum dananjaya Ata Ata if therefore, if therefore, chitam, chitam, mind, mind, samadatam, samadatam, to fix, to fix, na, na, not, not, saknosi, saknosi, you are able, you are able, my e, my e, upon me, upon me, stiram, stiram, steadily, steadily. Abhyasa yogena Abhyasa yogena By the practice of devotional service By the practice of devotional service Tata Tata There There oh, Then Then Mum Mum Life Life Echa Echa Desire Desire Aptum to, to get Dananjaya O winner of wealth Arjuna My dear Arjuna, O winner of wealth If you cannot fix your mind upon me without deviation 
then follow the regular principles of bhakti yoga and in this way develop a desire to attain me. You can repeat after me, my dear Arjuna, my dear Arjuna, O winner of wealth, O winner of wealth, if you cannot fix your mind upon me, if you cannot fix your mind upon me, without deviation, without deviation, then follow, then follow the regulated principle, the regulated principle of bhakti yoga, of bhakti yoga. In this way, in this way, develop a desire, develop a desire to attain me, to attain me. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. In this verse, two different processes of bhakti yoga are indicated. The first applies to one who has actually developed an attachment for Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, by transcendental love. And the other is for one who has not developed an attachment for the Supreme Person by transcendental love. For the second class, there are different prescribed rules and regulations. One can follow to be ultimately elevated to the stage of attachment to Krishna. Bhakti Yoga is a purification of the senses. At the present moment in material existence, the senses are always impure being engaged in sense gratification. But by the practice of bhakti yoga, these senses can become purified and in the purified state, they can direct, they, they come directly in contact with the Supreme Lord. In this material existence, I may be engaged in some service to some master, but I don't really lovingly serve my master. I simply serve to get some money. And the master who is not in love, and the master also is not in love. He takes service from me and pays me. So there is no question of love. But for spiritual life, one must be elevated to the pure stage of love. That stage of love can be achieved by practice of devotional service performed with the present senses. The love of God is now in a dormant state in everyone's heart. And there, love of God is manifested in different ways but it is contaminated by material association. Now the heart has to be purified of the material association and that dormant natural love for Krishna has to be revived. This is the whole process. To practice the regulated principles of bhakti yoga one should, under the guidance of an expert spiritual master, follow certain principles. One should rise early in the morning, take bath, enter the temple, and offer prayers, and chant Hare Krishna. Then collect flowers to offer to the deity, cook foodstuffs to offer to the deity take prasadam, and so on. There are various rules and regulations which one should follow, and one should constantly hear Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam from pure devotees. This practice can help anyone rise to the level of love of God, and then he is sure of his progress into the spiritual kingdom of God. This practice of bhakti yoga under the rules and regulations with the direction of a spiritual master will surely bring one 
to the stage of love of God. Om Jnana Timarandasya Jnana Shalakaya Chaksur Militamena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobisam Stavitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Tadaki Svapatantikam Vande ham Shri Guru Shri Yata Parakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Sha Shri Rupam Sakrajatam Sahagana Raganathan Vitam Sam Sajivam Sarvaitam Savadudam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakani Tamsya He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagapade Gopisha Gopisha Kanta Namaste Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Rahe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishavanus Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchakalpata Rupyasya Kripa Sindhu Vyadevacha Patitanam Pahanevyo Vaishnavivyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shiva Sadi Gaurabhata Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So Lord Krishna had been describing how the highest yogi will fix his mind on Krishna without deviation, thinking of Krishna at every moment. So that's really a very elevated stage of yoga practice and I don't think we'll find it very easy for us to actually do that. You know, we think of Krishna, but to think of Krishna at every moment without deviation is something very, very difficult for us. So, Lord Krishna is saying to Arjuna, if you cannot do that, then he's taking it down, you know. Just like you know, maybe you go to, to purchase something and maybe the man asks a price for it and he says, oh no, no, it's too expensive, you know. And so the man may say, well, you know, I can give you a special offer, we have a discount at this time, you know, and we'll give you a discount. And, you know, like that, to bring the price down, you see. So Lord Krishna, in the same way, is describing Bhakti Yoga and he started at the very top of the ladder of yoga, the highest level, that we should fix our mind on Krishna without deviation, without any thought of anything else other than the service of Lord Krishna. But, all right, you can't do that. It's just too difficult. You find it difficult. Then there's something else. Then Krishna gives us as a second choice. All right, you can't do that. It's a, Follow the regulated principles of bhakti yoga. And in this way, we'll develop a desire to attain Krishna. So following the regulated principles of bhakti yoga. Now, people may think, well, okay, I follow four principles. But Krishna doesn't mean that. That's not what the regulated principles of Bhakti Yoga are. You see, the regulated, the four regulated principles, they're for all civilized people. Everyone, 
it's meant to follow the four regulative principles of no meat eating, no intoxication, no gambling, and no illicit sex. These things are meant to be practiced by civilized people everywhere. But the regulative principles of bhakti yoga, that's something else. And Srila Prabhupada explains what he means when he said, when Lord Krishna says the regulative principles, what does it mean? Actually, Prabhupada begins the purport by saying that there's actually two ways in which we can understand this, uh, these principles of bhakti yoga. Just like in the nectar of devotion, if you study Prabhupada's books, The Nectar of Devotion. How many of you have done Bhakti Shastri? Some people? Huh? Many are doing now. You're doing now? Good. Okay, so you will study The Nectar of Devotion. So in The Nectar of Devotion, it describes that Bhakti Yoga is performed at three levels. There is devotional service in practice, which is called Sadhana Bhakti. Then there is devotional service in ecstasy, which we call bhava bhakti. And then there's devotional service in love of God, which is prema bhakti. So bhava and prema, they're very high. They're very exalted levels of devotional service. We're meant to do sadhana bhakti. And sadhana bhakti is also dis divided into two levels. There is, first of all, uh, Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti, and then there is Raganuga Sadhana Bhakti. So Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti means devotional service which is according to the rules and regulations. And these rules and regulations are not just no meat, fish and eggs, no intoxicant. You know, of course, those those things are that is essential. Everyone, you know, has to follow that. There's no question of not following that, those principles. But to do bhakti yoga, there are other things which you have to practice also. And Prabhupada mentions what these things are. He talks about waking up early in the morning. Now, not waking up early in the morning and rushing off to work. <laughs> you know, people may do that. You have to, you have to work, of course. But, you know, but waking up early in the morning to do service for Krishna. Just like the temples, you know, they open earlier in the morning before most people are awake, you know. Uh, here in Malaysia, temple, we have... At our Butterworth Temple, we have Mangalarti five o'clock in the morning. Usually in India, Mangalarti is at four thirty in the morning. But the sun rises a little later here, so the Mangalarti is delayed a little bit because it should be during what is called Brahma Muhurta, the auspicious time in the morning. Brahma Muhurta is auspicious time for meditation on God and those who are practicing some kind of spiritual process will take advantage of that auspicious time in the day to wake up early in the morning and after bathing and putting on clean cloth and so on and of course as devotees we also mark our body with the sacred tilak and then we will sit for meditation or not necessarily sit, but we will pick up our beads and we'll begin to chant. Or we may go straight to the Mongol Arti and take part in the Mongol the Mongo Arti. Mongo meaning auspicious. Take part in chanting the glories of the Lord by attending the Mongol Arti, seeing the deities offering prayers and so on. So these activities, this is what we call the, the principles of bhakti yoga. 
that we should do these kind of activities every day. We're meant to do these things every day. Just like every day we eat and we sleep, and you, every day you're going to bathe, take a bath, change your dress and so on. So every day we want to do these activities of bhakti yoga, chanting, worshipping the deity, hearing scriptures like Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, these things very important for us to keep us healthy in spiritual life. When you want to keep your health, you have to take care of your health. You have to look after yourself regularly. We don't just only think about others all the time. You know, of course, as devotees, we do try to be compassionate and think about benefiting others. But in order to benefit others, we have to take care of ourselves first. We have to be healthy. We have to be pure. And then we're, we will be able to give benefit to others. If we ourselves are diseased and contaminated, how can we help others? So it's very important for us that we understand these regulated principles and we practice these principles faithfully under the direction of the spiritual teacher. So that is called Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti, according to the rules and regulations. This year, we have also Purushottamas, right? Purushottamas. It's once every three years or every third year or something, you have the Purushottamas, the extra month in the year. So that is considered very inauspicious time for material activities. No marriage takes place during Purushottamas, considered very inauspicious. Not very good for business and so on that time. But Purushottamas is actually very good for spiritual activities. Very good time to do more chanting and to increase our worship of the Lord, and especially for people who may be newcomers, it's a very good time for them to take advantage of the, the, the time of the year to progress in their spiritual life. And many devotees do make vows during that time of Purushottam Mass to do more chanting, and to do more service for Krishna. So that's one of, like one of the principles of bhakti yoga. There are many different rules and regulations which we follow. And uh, Prabhupada didn't put too much emphasis on the rules and regulations in the beginning. Srila Prabhupada, of course, began the movement in the West, he had gone to New York and he was introducing this process of Krishna consciousness to Westerners, Westerners, young Westerners. And so Prabhupada didn't put a lot of emphasis on the rules and regulations. Even it's described that when Srila Prabhupada gave initiation in the beginning, the devotees didn't even know what were the regulated principles. And they were so new, they, they didn't really know what was happening. But they were attracted to Krishna. So Srila Prabhupada followed this principle, which had been given by Rupa Goswami, that somehow or other get people attracted to Krishna. And the rules and regulations come later. Gradually we in introduce the rules and regulations. Just like uh, there was this one devote, one person who helped Srila Prabhupada in the beginning. His name was Allen Ginsberg. He was a famous author and a poet and he was something of a 
a recognized leader of the, the young people during the times of the 60s. So Allen Ginsberg uh, was a person who had been to India and he had been to India and he was familiar with the chanting of Hare Krishna and uh, he, he was attracted when he heard about Prabhupada coming to New York and teaching people to chant Hare Krishna. And he actually helped Srila Prabhupada to get the green card so that he could stay in America. So he did very valuable service for Srila Prabhupada. And so Srila, he met Prabhupada and he was saying to Prabhupada, he said, he said, you know, I said, I said, you know, you want to make these people brahmanas? You want to make them all brahmanas? How will you ever do it, you know, that we're so far away from all these rules and regulations which the brahmanas follow? But Srila Prabhupada said, yes, uh, he said, I'm only giving a few rules and regulations for the beginning, for rule, you know, no, don't eat meat, fish and eggs, these things. He said, but he said, if I was to tell you everything, you would never believe it. You'd never be able to follow it. There's so many rules and regulations. But somehow or other, the important thing is get people attached to Krishna. Get them attached to chanting Hare Krishna, to eating prasada, and coming to see Krishna, and being with devotees. These activities, they help so much in the beginning to get people involved in this process of bhakti yoga. You can see that it's an elaborate structure. There's a many different levels by which bhakti yoga is performed. I'm talking about Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti, that get people to think about Krishna and don't worry about the rules and regulations. But then there's a more advanced stage, which is called Raganuka Bhakti, which is spontaneous devotion. Now that spontaneous devotion comes after one has already practiced Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti, after one has practiced all the rules and regulations for a long time, then he gradually, after some time, he will come to that level where he will do everything naturally. He will naturally, spontaneously be thinking of, thinking of Krishna and chanting Hare Krishna. And at that level of Raganuga Bhakti, one doesn't have to worry so much about the rules and regulations. One just has to, because one is so absorbed in thought of Krishna. So this, this of course, Prabhupada in the purport, he talks about someone having transcendental love for Krishna. So if you have that kind of transcendental love for Krishna, then the rules and regulations are not so important. But the rules and regulations are important in the beginning to bring us to that level of transcendental love. It's a long way up to come up to that level of developing transcendental love for Krishna. So, Lord Krishna wants to encourage Arjuna. If you can't, you can't think of me all the time. So, just try to follow the regulated principles of Bhakti Yoga. And the regulated principles of Bhakti Yoga, Prabhupada explained two levels. One is for people who have transcendental love for Krishna.
and the other is for the people who don't have that transcendental love, like us. You know, we don't really have that kind of transcendental love for Krishna. So we need to follow the basic rules and regulations of sadhana bhakti, observing different festivals. That's a part of bhakti yoga, observing the festivals, just like we will have uh, Rathyatra, or you had Snan Yatra, right? You did the Snan Yatra here for your Jagannath deities, I was hearing. So it's one of the festivals which we have. And then we have also Rathyatra festival. And we have Janmastami, we have Gorpurnima, Ram Nomi, Nusringa Chaturdasi, all of these festivals. We have to observe these festivals. And we will observe them. Uh, by doing things like also fasting sometimes. Next Sunday is the appear is the disappearance of Bhaktivinoda Thakur. It's a half day fast. We observe a half day, no breakfast. Not a big deal, right? Take a good lunch. Take a good lunch. Make up for it at lunchtime. So next Sunday something to look forward to it's a bhakti Vinod thakur's festival and we honor our great acharya by having a half day fast and offering a feast a, a sumptuous feast with many different premises. so this is all part of bhakti yoga cooking for krishna we don't just cook for our own self i was distributing books one time in a Buddhist country over in Taiwan, Taiwan, in Taiwan, yes, China, part of, you know, Chinese people there, Taiwan, so there, it's a Buddhist country, and, uh, I, <laughs> So I was showing a, a book, one of our cookbooks. Maybe you know those books, Cooking with Kurma. Yeah. You know Kurma? Yeah. Kurma is an Australian body devotee, and he had a very successful television series, Cooking with Kurma. It was on satellite television for a long time. So he published a number of cookbooks, vegetarian cookbooks, and naturally, you know, publishing a cookbook, you want to put nice colorful pictures and make the food look very sumptuous and delicious. So I was showing this book and what happened, some Buddhist monk came and he was looking at the book and he said, oh, this is sense gratification. This is Maya, you know, he was saying like, this is my, how you can eat all of this opulent food. This is not proper, you know, you are the sadhus, you are the holy man, you should eat simple food. You should, you know, in Buddhism they like to practice austerities, you know, a bit like the jnanis and the vedantis, you know, they would do tapasya. Even they have soap, they will have soap without any fragrance. <laughs> mm, and they will... They will cook, but there should not be any taste, you know, it should not be <laughs> right, yeah. everything very plain, you know, right. So he was saying, this, this cooking, cooking like this, this, he was saying this cooking like this, this is maya, he said, this is not for uh, people who are wanting to achieve self-realization to progress on the spiritual path, you'll become controlled by the tongue. So I told him, no, you have to understand, when we cook, we're not cooking for ourselves, we cook for Krishna. So this concept, this is something which is not appreciated by Buddhist people and also the Mayavadis, the impersonalists, the Ghanis, these people, who are renouncing the world, and they want to renounce everything. But we want to use everything 
in the service of Krishna. The jnanis, they say, my uh, Brahma Satyam Jagat Mitya, they say this world is all illusion, only the Brahman is true. But we say, no, everything is real. Brahman Satyam Jagat Satyam, the world, this world is also real. It is temporary, but it is real. And we have to use it in the service of Krishna. So the principles of Bhakti Yoga are to utilize everything in the service of Krishna. Just like we have this nice house here, we're using it for the service of Krishna. We're not using it just for our own eating and sleeping, but it's for the service of Krishna. That's very different. Everyone else, you have your home, you use it, you use your place for eating and sleeping. But this house, this is Krishna's temple. This is for Krishna's pleasure. We're all here to serve Krishna. And we come here to glorify Krishna and to worship Krishna. So this is bhakti yoga, using everything for the pleasure of Krishna. Why? Because Krishna is the proprietor. Everything belongs to him. It's meant for his pleasure. So we, we have that feeling in performing bhakti yoga. That this is Krishna's. I am his servant. And when, we give, when you give money for, the, for Krishna also, there are two levels by which person may donate to Krishna. Some person may be doing karma yoga. He may be at the level of karma yoga. The karma yogi, he's thinking, I am giving this to Krishna, thinking I'm giving this. But the bhakti yogi, he doesn't think I'm giving this to Krishna. He thinks this is Krishna's. It's all his. Nothing is mine. That is the thinking of the bhakti yogi. The one who has the real devotion for Krishna, he doesn't consider himself to be the proprietor. It's all Krishna's. And he wants to utilize everything in the service of Krishna. So we try to explain this to people, to bring them out of illusion. The illusion, the nature of illusion is to think, first of all, I am this body. This belongs to me. And we are thinking everything is meant for the satisfaction of my senses. We want to enjoy the body, the senses, and principal sense, the tongue. We like to enjoy the tongue. We like to taste all kinds of food stuff, and we like to talk all kinds of things also. So the yoga process is to control the mind and the senses. Fixing the mind, how to control the mind. Just like this verse, uh, Lord Krishna had described, fix your mind upon me without deviation. But earlier, in the sixth chapter, Lord Krishna had described meditation and yoga to Arjuna. And Arjuna said, I can't do this. He said, my mind is more turbulent and restless than the wind. It's very difficult for me to control my mind. It's chancha, the word is chanchal, eh? chanchala hi mana Krishna. Arjuna is saying, my mind is chanchala. It's rest, it won't stay in one place. You th one minute you're thinking of Penang, next minute you're thinking of Butterworth, next minute you're thinking of Kuala Lumpur. You know, the mind is wandering every moment. One minute we're thinking this person, next minute we're thinking that person. The mind is always moving so fast. So we have to learn to train the mind. And it's, it's not an easy task. It's difficult. Arjuna said, therefore, when Krishna had told Arjuna, you have to fix the mind, Arjuna said, I can't do it. He said, my mind is worse than the wind more difficult to control than the wind. 
So did Lord Krishna agree? Well, to some extent he said, well, I know it's difficult. Yeah, I know it's difficult, but it is possible. And Lord Krishna said, you have to practice. Abhyasena tu konteya vairagyena chagriyad. Two things are required. Constant practice and detachment. You want to practice bhakti yoga, you're going to have to practice. Just like you want to play the piano, you have to practice, right? You want to play this thing, you have to practice. You want to drive the car, you have to practice. What, do you, what can you do without practice? Even cooking, Prabhupada, cooking is all practice. It's an art, you have to practice. Srila Prabhupada said, he, he learned cooking by watching people in the street. He saw the people in the street cooking and he would practice. It's all like that. Madanga, play the Madanga. Tushta was playing Madanga, right? And that, so it's not easy. There's a lot of mantras you have to learn and you know, practice. It takes a lot of practice. And similarly, controlling the mind, it takes practice. And it requires another thing also, vairagya, detachment. We have to let go. We're, we have the tendency to want to hold on to material things. We don't like to let go. So Lord Krishna is saying here, if you practice these principles of bhakti yoga, you will develop a desire to attain. You haven't attained them yet, but you've developed a desire, at least you've got a desire to want to come to Him. That is very good, if you've got that desire. But to get that kind of desire, first you have to practice the principles of Bhakti Yoga. And we have to practice them regularly with detachment don't hold on to the material we have to let go how do we let go oh well, that's so difficult how can i let go of the material thing it's made very easy for us in krishna consciousness you let go of the material by holding on to krishna just simply by chanting hari krishna mantra Worshipping the deity, doing service for Krishna. This is how we let go of the material. We simply hold on to the spiritual. Take up the spiritual activities. And then you have no time for the material activities. If you're always engaged in the service of Krishna, then you don't have time for the service of Maya. Maya, right? The, on one side there's Krishna, on the other side there is Maya. And we say, Krishna Surya Sam, Maya Haya Andika. Yahan Krishna Tahannahi, Mayaya Adika. Krishna is like the sun, and Maya is like darkness. Where there is Krishna, there can be no Maya. Where there is light, there can be no darkness. When the sun comes out, then there's no more darkness. Immediately the darkness is gone. As soon as you switch the light, immediately the light goes off. And immediately the darkness comes. In the same way, as soon as we give up the shelter of Krishna, immediately we put into mind. We come in the, the realm of Maya. And the Maya, a realm of Maya means illusion. An illusion. What is that illusion? The number one illusion. I am this body. And this belongs to me. This is mine. So we say I and mine. Or aham and mamiti. I am this body. This is mine. This is the illusion of material life. And that's where all of our sufferings begin. 
it all comes about from that consciousness. So we have to change that consciousness. And how to do we change we can change that consciousness very easily, very quickly, just by taking part in the activities of Krishna consciousness. Just by chanting, coming to temple regularly, reading Bhagavad Gita, cooking for Krishna, have a nice altar. If you don't come to temple, then have the altar in your home and worship Krishna. Altar is not just only for offering food. <laughs> Make the offering, you know, we think altars for making the offering and then we have a nice food tea. But the altar is not just only for offering food. It's also meant we offer worship, we should offer prayers, we should actually develop the mood of giving service to Krishna. And that, that is naturally there within all of us, that we all have the nature to want to serve. Everyone it has that nature to be the servant. And that is what, the, the, in Sanskrit, there is this karitas dharma. Dharma, the nature of everything. Prabhupada explains, he says, the dharma of sugar is sweet. If the sugar is not sweet, something wrong, right? <laughs> and the dharma of chili is hot. Chili should be hot, not hot, no, no good, right? So the same way, the dharma of the soul, of the, the atma, the dharma is to serve. Everyone is engaged in some kind of service. We are serving God, or we should be serving God, but we are serving so many other things. We are serving dog, we are serving this one and that one. Yes. yes, we have so many things we are serving. But actually the real service is meant to be directed towards God, the Supreme. And we are His parts and parcels. So when we connect to Him, that is Bhakti Yoga, that is Yoga. Connecting ourselves to the Supreme by love, not just Prabhupada explains here how material world, somebody is working in the company, there's no love there between the employer and the employee. You know, the boss and the workers, do they love each other? <laughs> Can I imagine? Anytime they'll tell you, no, no money, go, I don't need you anymore. They'll kick you out, you know. There's no real loving there, loving exchange there. But in relation to Krishna, it is not just simply service, but it is loving service. That is bhakti yoga, rendering service with love that we want to serve. Just like when we are chanting, nobody's paying us to chant. We, we do it out of loving feeling for Krishna. And the same way we offer RT, we come for the program, nobody pays us to come here. We come because we have some love, we want to actually serve Krishna. So that mood has to be nourished more. We have to awaken that consciousness to want to serve Krishna. And that's why we have to hear about Krishna more and more, more and more regularly we have to hear. And when it becomes more and more regularly, gradually it will become spontaneous. That one day we will naturally think of Krishna. To give the example, uh, waking up in the morning, in the beginning, you know, when I first became a devotee, and with the wake up for Mongol RT, oh, it's so early, oh, it's so difficult to wake up that time in the morning, very difficult. But after some time, then it becomes natural. In the beginning, you have the alarm clock to wake up. But then after some time, you don't need the alarm clock. You wake up yourself naturally. So it becomes spontaneous. And the same way, our devotion for Krishna 
also becomes more and more spontaneous as we go on following the rules and regulations. We develop more desire to want to serve Krishna. We want to serve Krishna. Uh, but the devotee becomes more and more conscious about the different rules and regulations. In the beginning, we just chant Hare Krishna. I met one man and he was telling me, he said, you know, in the beginning they told me all I had to do was chant Hare Krishna. He said, then they told me I had to come to temple. Then they told me I had to do the deity worship. Then they told me I had to do it. And one after another they added so many things. But I never knew I had to do all these things in the beginning. But they told me in the beginning I would never have come. Yeah? And so they tricked me. <laughs> uh, and I think this is quite common for all of us. We get that kind of experience coming to Krishna consciousness that it's like that. We have no idea what we're getting into. But as we come, when you know, we gradually, we, it becomes more and more spontaneous. So in this way, Krishna is encouraging, you know, follow the principles and get a desire to attain. And Krishna will go on and say, well, if you can't follow the principles, what to do? You know, we do have devotees like that. Not everybody can follow the principles of bhakti yoga. So if you can't follow the principles, Lord Krishna will come down the ladder. He's not going to say, get out of here. And all. No, but he's got another level, another level which you can take up. You can't follow the principle. Okay, then do this, do it like this. So for everyone according to their own ability, do what you can for Krishna, right? All right, so Prabhu told me talk to all about this time and then we'll take questions. Right? Hare Krishna, thank you very much. Maharaj, such a wonderful inspiration class. Big Hari book. So we have uh, open questions. Uh, I arrange 15 minutes for any question answer. If you don't have questions, we'll go to the next event. I don't want to say what is the next event, then you won't ask question. Uh, any question? Any question? Any question? Any question? Any question? Anybody has any questions? You can uh, ask questions related to today's topic or whatever. That which you need to understand. Maharaj, uh, uh, for your information, Maharaj, in Gulugor, we don't have a, a high pujari now for almost a year. Oh. So Very now, good. every day, someone is taking, you know, uh, their service for Mangalarti. Some uh, uh, one is doing for cooking. And someone has to do come for the evening Gaurati. Mm -hmm. Someone is have to come for cleaning of the temple. Mm -hmm. Someone has to come for the washing of the pots and all these things. And they are pestering me. Why you are never hire Pujari? <laughs> but I feel this is a such a wonderful opportunity for my congregation members that they are involving in the service, learning service. So what, what is your advice, Maharaj? I need your blessings to them. Yeah. I'm very happy to hear this. I think it's very good that you do the activities yourselves. You know, you don't want to depend on people coming all the way from Mayapur <laughs> to do your puja for you. <laughs> it's not really the process. We should be doing these things ourselves. And, you know, we have to make the temple, make the center here. We should be able to maintain it without bringing people from India to come here to do everything for us. Certainly, Prabhupada wouldn't like to see that we had to bring in people from India all the way here to do our puja. So, it, it's also a nice opportunity for everyone to be engaged in the service of Krishna. To let other people come and you think, oh, no, I will work in the factory, I will just give the money for his, you know, for him to do the puja. 
that's, that's not good. It's not the process. Rich people, some wealthy people, they do like that, you know, they have the deity in their home and they hire a priest to come and do the puja. But that's not, you know, that's, that's not really how it's meant to be. It's not so pleasing to Krishna. Krishna likes to see our own endeavor, how much we are endeavoring to please Krishna. That is important. And that makes a difference at the time of death. When we have to leave the body, Krishna will want to know, how much have you done? How much have you served me throughout your life? That will make the difference. So we want to take advantage while you still have the health and the strength and the energy in your body, use it to do some service for Krishna. Don't just give some money to pay for other people to come and do everything. Better you try to do the service yourselves. Certainly when we began the movement here, uh, we didn't bring the, the devotees came, they didn't hire people to do things. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Hare Pram. One question, uh, very nice class, thank you for your guidance. And one question I want to ask, how we are able to know that Krishna is pleased by our service? How do we know that Krishna is pleased? We know when the devotees are pleased. If the spiritual master is pleased, and if the devotees are pleased, then we can understand that Krishna is pleased. We want to please Krishna, then we act according to the instructions from the spiritual teachers, the senior Vaishnavas, you act according to their instructions, and if they are pleased, then Krishna will also be pleased. Following Krishna's instructions also, you know, you, we should know what are Krishna's instructions. If we don't know what are Krishna's teachings, then of course it's more difficult. How are you going? You don't know how to please Krishna. You want to serve Krishna, but you don't know what he wants you to do. We should know. So we should read the books. Just like Krishna says, you know, patram pushpam palam toyam. Offer me a leaf, flower, water and fruit with love and devotion and I will accept it. So Krishna Krishna wants us to offer these things. We cannot offer meat. We cannot offer fish and eggs and onion and garlic. We can't offer these things to Krishna. Krishna doesn't like these things. Krishna is a vegetarian. Krishna is brought up in brunch in Vrindavan. You know, he's not going to eat onion and garlic. And you cannot ask him to eat these things. Oh Krishna, I like to eat these things. You please I have to offer. No. No, you have to we have to please Krishna. We have to know what he wants. He wants a certain standard. He wants us to chant the holy name. He's pleased when people chant his holy name. He is attracted by the devotees chanting the holy name. Krishna said, Naham tishtani vaikunte yoginam ridayeshuva tatra tishtani narada yatra gayanti madbhakta. Krishna said, I am not in the hearts of the yogis meditating on me. And I'm not in the vaikuntha either. I'm not in the spiritual world. But I am wherever my devotees like Narad are chanting my holy name. So by chanting the holy name of Krishna, you can attract Lord Krishna. You can please him. He will come. But if you're not chanting Krishna's name, if you're singing Maya, all the mundane movies and the pop songs of the material, then Krishna will run away. He'll be far away. He's not going to be attracted. So Krishna's got his taste, what Krishna likes, what he doesn't like. He's a person, just like we all have things we like and things we don't like. 
then we have to know what is pleasing to Krishna. And we learn from the spiritual teacher. Srila Prabhupada taught us how to please Krishna, what we have to do. Any more questions? Maharaj, sometimes we have deities at home, and uh, I think most of uh, the devotees they have. We have uh, scheduled congregation programs in uh, centers or temples, and uh, during the time, and you know, uh, what is your advice for the devotees that sometimes they say, I have to, you know, do puja at home, then I have to come, uh, because when we have a temple on that particular day, uh, what is your advice to the guidance? Because we want the devotees to come right on the time for the temple programs and uh, uh, <clears throat> that to, to prioritize which uh, these, these are the things you can guide these devotees. Well, maybe you have Gornitai deities at home, but Gornitai is also here. And there's no difference, Gornitai at home and Gornitai here. And so it's better you come here and serve the deities here because all the devotees are here. When you just be at home, you have your own standards. So your standard won't be as high as the standard here. So Srila Prabhupada actually encouraged the devotees that they should be going to temple. He didn't think everybody had to keep their own deities at home. It's all right. You can have your deities at home, but you should be willing to also to come to the temple to do service. And if it is, if you serve the deities here, the deity at home is also being served. There's no difference. Any more questions? Maharaj, one more question from me. Uh, about this mind, uh, intelligent, uh, subconscious uh, mind there. You know, sometimes when we drive our car, our hands move automatically without focusing. We go back from office to listening. Let's say we are chanting uh, the names of Lord. Our bodies works automatically. And at the same time, we have intelligence coming in, thinking something. And um, so, um, uh, I, I, I want to know actually, uh, Maharaj, um, you know, which is actually uh, this subconscious thinking, the mind thinking, the intelligent thinking and you know the, the automatically sometimes you know happening you know the hands does the work automatically but we also think something you know so um, and these things actually sometimes uh, uh, it's it's a hindrance in the pure chanting uh, you know and can Maharaj enlighten uh, exactly uh, how to actually put into the control uh, to which is the highest, uh, what do you call, uh, to put it to a highest taste of the chanting of the uh, Lord's name. All right, to overcome the mind and intelligence in our chanting. Yes, we, they want to, we don't want to be chanting on the mental platform. But the Srila Prabhupada stressed the important activity in chanting is hearing and chanting. So he encouraged loud chanting of the holy name. You have to hear, Prabhupada, lips have to move. You use the tongue to chant. You don't just sit. You know, people sit, they hold the beads and, I'm chanting. You don't hear anything. <laughs> I'm chanting. Yeah. That's not good chanting. If you call it chanting, it's not very good chanting, not good at all. Lips have to move, there has to be sound, and that sound is, the louder you chant, the more powerful it becomes. So you want to control the mind and intelligence, and loud chanting is encouraged. You can hear Prabhupada's chanting box, you hear Prabhupada very clearly chanting the mantra. So we have to chant also like that. And Prabhupada said, our chanting should be like the child calling, well, or two babies. Three babies. Yes. Yes. Well, three. <laughs> no, I thought it was one. 
So, uh, Prabhupada said our chanting should be like the child calling for the parents. You know, when the child is crying, that it's only the parents that's going to stop the child crying. And, you know, if I come, you know, the child's going to scream, you know. <laughs> but the mother comes and she, the child is happy. So our chanting should be like the child separating from Krishna, that we're calling to Krishna, calling out to Krishna. So the chanting has to be done like that. We have to chant from the heart. His Holiness Sachinanda and Swami would always say when you did Daskar, chant from the heart. The feeling of the heart has to be there. In other words, you have to be conscious. Don't just be mechanically chanting and drip your mind is some other place. Your mind is thinking, oh well for breakfast I have dosa, <laughs> uh, lunchtime I'm going to go out and um, you know, you're sitting chanting, holding the but we're thinking about breakfast and lunch and what I'm going to do today. No, that is not good chanting. We have to get away from the mind, the mental platform. You have to hear the holy name. So loud chanting helps us to hear, to focus on the chanting. So it's very important for us to try to do this. Then we think best time to chant is early in the morning. And so, you know, if you're coming to temple early in the morning and you, you chant, you'll see very powerful, very effective to come chant the holy name early in the morning. Later at night, of course, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said you can chant any time, but it is more powerful, most power there is early in the morning. So we train the devotees, wake up early, don't be sleeping late, you have to get up early in the morning. Usually probably say four o'clock, you have to be up by four o'clock. Sleep what time, Maharaj? Huh? Sleep what time? Wake up, I know. Sleep what time? Oh yeah, sleep. That's up to you, but you got to get up at 4 o'clock. If you sleep late, that's your problem. But still you got to get up. No excuses. Right? Uh, you go to some temples, you go, if you go to some temples, the devotees are so fired up. If you go to a temple like Pune, you know, you go to Pune, some devotees, well, well, I, I knew this, some devotees, they told me they were traveling in India and they went, they got to Pune in the middle of the night and they thought, oh, it's the middle of the night, we're reaching in Pune, nobody will be up there in the temple. So they got there to the temple very early in the morning and they were surprised that devotees, some devotees were already up chanting Japa. It was very early in the morning, but they had the habit to get up very early and they would chant all their rounds before Mongol Arti. Before Mongol Arti, they, were, and they even had a class before Mongol Arti. <laughs> you know, if we had a class here before Mongol Arti, well, would anybody be here? You know, nobody would be here. <laughs> But Pune, you know, they're so fired up, they're so, they're so eh, determined. They get up early, chant all the rounds, early in the morning, and then they can read Prabhupada's books. They have time to do a lot of service, have more time to serve Krishna. You get your chanting done, done early in the morning, you have more time to do more service. So, Maharaj, these devotees are brahmacharis or they are normal uh, working grihastas? Yeah, some brahmacharis, some, bra some grihastas. You do get some grihastas also do these things. Yeah. yeah. Lord Chaitanya decided, why waste so much time sleeping at night? We'll just chant all night. <laughs> and Lord Chaitanya was having kirtan, Srivasangam every night. The whole night. Hey, why bother to sleep? We just have kirtan all night. And the devotees came, they were all enjoying kirtan. Right? So we were encouraging, you know. You can have nice festivals like Vaikuntha Ikarasi. You can organize Vaikuntha Ikarasi, have kirtan the whole night. 
Very nice. Hare Krishna, Maharaj, can I ask one question? Yes, you can ask. Is uh, something using the bean bag, uh, using the pizza, more powerful than the uh, pickle? No, not necessarily. The main thing is you chant. Whether you use a clicker or you use beats, that's okay. But you have to chant loudly the whole mantra. Don't miss out words. So Maharaj, when we when we hear, does it mean when we hear it controls minds, intelligence and the subconscious? Yes, mind? of course. If you're hearing the holy name, then you're not thinking. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Hare Maharaj. Maharaj, I have um, one question which I'm also a little bit confused because I work in a hotel which is um, time limited for me. Well, I have to finish my 16 rounds so while I'm driving, I will also chant using my beats. And at the same time, I also play on the music, which music, Bhagavad Gita, on my uh, car, in my car. So which is more pref uh, prefer preferable, I would say? You hear the class, you mean? No the class, Gita, uh, Bhagavad Gita in the disc. You're hearing lecture. Hearing that, lecture. Uh, not lecture, it's Bhagavad Slow class. Yeah, and the translations. And well, you can't be hearing two things at one time. And I'm no, chanting because... I need to finish up my rounds as well, that's why. Then you cannot hear the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. So I put it softly. Either softly. you hear the Bhagavad Gita or you chant Hare Krishna. Oh, so I do one thing. Yes. So I, then, I switch it off or I chant? Yes. Alright. Thank you, Maharaj. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any more? Last question. Many, many of us are chanting. Despite chanting very attentively, still we ending up making uh, mistakes. We are committing mistakes with devotees and all kind of problems. So what I see that many of us don't understand the purpose and the meaning of chanting, especially like what uh, Mahaprabhu says, Tarana pi suni chena, tarura pi sai So we don't understand the real meaning. Simply we are chanting, we are ending up in make, making uh, making offenses, mistakes. So what is the advice? Well, my advice is more chanting, <laughs> more association with devotees, more hearing and more chanting. That will help you. Okay, we'll end the uh, uh, question and answer since we are late. A big round of applause to Maharaj. Thank you very much, Maharaj.